Okay, so I thought it would be fun and useful to just make a short video uh, talking about a very important property of the callback Leibler divergence, which is that it's greater than or equal to zero, um, and it's only equal to zero like if and only if the two probability distributions are the same. That's actually, that, that's actually, that makes it also very useful because then it allows you uh, to use it, um, well, essentially, to, to, it allows you to, to use it as a measure of the dissimilarity between two distributions because you won't you won't risk getting you won't have risk um, spurious matches you won't have you won't have situations where p equals q or p doesn't equal to q but the kl is is zero so we're gonna so i'm gonna do this uh, for the discrete setting only just to kind of get the idea across so let's recall what the kl is in that case so kl of p q is going to equal on sum and I'll often just drop the ends of the probability of, you know, the i symbol uh, times log of p of x i given uh, q of x i. Okay. Now, uh, one way that's going to be useful for us, to, and you'll see why in just a moment, is just write this as. Uh, oops. Um, sum on i p of x i of minus the log of uh, q of x i over p of x i. The reason why we do that is because minus log, so you know the, the log function is, looks like this, uh, this is log, so minus log, it's gonna look like that, so this is minus log. And the cool thing about minus log is that it is convex, and, specific, and more importantly, um, well, I guess just as importantly, uh, it's, strictly convex. So you can see that um, if, you have, if you draw a chord between any two points that are different, the chord always lies above above the, the function. Now why is that important? Well it's important because we're going to want to use Jensen's inequality to prove all these things. So Jensen's inequality is about convex functions. So let's just recall what Jensen's inequality was. So Jensen's inequality was so it said you know if f is uh, for convex f it said that this um, the sum of pi of you know that's actually sorry p of x i f of x i is greater than or equal to um, the sum of sorry f uh, times the sum of P of x i, x i, and remember the so there was kind of an intuitive there was an intuitive picture which is essentially the one that I've already drawn. So the idea is you know this is your x, this is f of x, this is um, yeah so this, this this would be your various points. Let's say this is uh, x one, this is you know x two, and now the point was that. We'll, we'll just consider for the case of two points. You know, if we draw the chord across um, for different values of p of x1 and x2, the left-hand side is going to kind of trace out the points. Uh, so let, let us just do that. So this is going to equal to this, right? So that's going to be, this is, you know, this is f of x1, this is f of x2, and the p of x, you know, p of x1, is going to, you know, the, the more the higher p of x one is, the more you know this point that we're going to you know trace out. The more it will shift that way, um, and the higher p of x two is, the more it will shift that way. But it will kind of trace out for different values of p of x, um, of the p of x size. It will trace out this chord. Now, what's what's going on on the on the right hand side? Well, this is going to be the function, so f of x evaluated at the average value of those points. So um, you know, there'll be a corresponding for each one of the, for each setting of the probabilities, there'll be a, a corresponding um, point that will average those two. So for example, maybe it'll be this one. And so F, so we just evaluate F at a single point and that'll be the kind of course, the weighted average determined by that probability distribution. And the point of Jensen's inequality is that if you have become a convex function, it doesn't have to be differentiable. Um, 
the interpolation of the point. So this this purple, this uh, pink point will always be above, um, on or above the orange point. So now, you know, if we uh, in general, so it's the question that you know, so that's that's kind of one aspect, and yeah, let's just let's just work with that for now. So we've got this we've got this relationship, and now we want to use it to prove that KL is um, greater than or equal to zero. So let's just do that. So I'm going to rewrite uh, our KL again. So here's KL PQ is going to equal to sum on P of xi times log. Oops. So minus log. So this is our convex function. This is kind of like our RF uh, log of, uh, what was it? It was Q of xi over P of xi, right? Okay, so now we want to apply, we want to, let's highlight Jensen's. So let's say we want to apply Jensen's inequality. So now immediately, if we look at this, we were, we've we got a little bit of a problem because in Jensen's inequality, so we've got P of xi, so that's good. Let's give ourselves a check for that. Um, we've got F being, you know, a strong, well, convex at least, and we've got that, so there's, there's F. But now what we expect to be being passed to F is xi. So but what we actually have some other function. We have this kind of ratio um, of the value. So the way to kind of get around this, let's, let's, let's give an x for this. The way to get around this is well, you're just going to redefine a new variable. So let's make a new variable ri, and that's going to be ri for like ratio, say, over p of xi. And now what's the probability of ri? Well, the probability is just ri is directly a function of xi. So the probability of ri is just going to equal to the probability of xi. So we can now just write our KL divergence. We can just write this as p of ri times minus log of uh, ri. So, and now this looks exactly like, so now we've got our p, we've got my, the, the convex function, and then we've also got it being applied to ri. So terrific. So now this just says, so Jensen's inequality says, well, this is going to be equal to, greater than or equal to minus log the sum of p of ri times ri. Okay. And so now we bring in our, our, our definition. So it's going to be equal to minus the log of, so this is equal to minus the log of sum of p of xi, so times ri, and what was ri? Well, ri was q of xi over p of xi, right? So now those two cancel, and now we've got minus the log of sum of q of xi, which is going to equal to minus the log of one, which is equal to zero, okay? So what, what this allows us to conclude is that k of l, p, Q is greater than or equal to zero. So that, that's, that's one. So it just says that this, this thing is non-negative. And that's very useful. So that's kind of kind of behaves like a distance. Um, it's not a distance because it's, it's not symmetric, but has at least has the positivity, non-negativity of a distance. But it still doesn't tell us um, that you know we're going to avoid spurious matches. So it still doesn't tell us that, you know, um, so the question is question. Can um, KL P equal to zero, but P, right? So is it possible for this measure to be zero? So you might think, oh, these two distributions um, are the same, but actually um, P doesn't equal to Q. Uh, and it, we're just gonna show that it, that it actually doesn't occur. And the reason why it doesn't occur is again, it's just it's actually due to Jensen's um, inequality again for strictly convex functions now. So now we need the strict convexity. So um, let's just let's just draw what what we're talking about again. So and the picture of that is intuitive. So so again, you know, we've got like oops, so we've got the point that we are oops, let's switch. So we've got the point that we're interpolating. And we've got uh, the value of the function at the interpolation of the, the arguments. 
And now the question is, so remember that we've got, you know, KL P equals Q. Remember we actually, we, we found out that it was equal to, uh, you know, the sum of, you know, minus log of RI. And we want to know when is this equal to um, minus log Right, so that's essentially the question we have. So, um, you know, our KL divergence was. Um, let me highlight this. So, our KL divergence, you know, the left-hand side from coming from Jensen's inequality was this, and we said it's greater than or equal to this right-hand side again coming from Jensen's inequality. When does equality hold? So now graphically, and we'll just do it for the case of two um, of two points. That just says when, when, um, for what, under what conditions. Um, does so the left hand side? So this is going to be there's kind of the purple bit and there's the orange bit. Under what conditions are they equal? Kind of in general. So you you can kind of get the funny cases where like if one of them the probability of one is one and the other one is zero, well you know you'll you'll um you'll get that match because you'll end up being here or here. But suppose the probabilities are you know they're all non-zero. Can you get uh, can you get the this you know the pink point to line up with the orange point? And you might think that that's actually not possible, but it turns out that it is um, if our two points are actually the same, right? Because if your two points are the same, well, then you kind of get this degeneracy where you know you get interpolation between the function values, which is the purple. Well, if the two function values are the same, the interpolation is going to be at the same point, um, and so is the function evaluated um, at um, at the interpolated argument. So let's just say, so um, uh, Jensen's inequality. So so equality. So let's write let's write Jensen's inequality again. So uh, let's say this Jensen says that. Um, the sum of p of ri of f of ri is greater than or equal to f times the sum ri. So equality holds in general so you know when the p's I think you know even in the case when the you know kind of hold degenerately when all the p's are zero except for one of them. But I'll just say in general. So we're you know we're worried about the general case when the p's are all you know you know positive. In general, um, I think you can. It's actually stronger than this. Um, if and only if the ri's, so these points we're evaluating, how you know have the same value for strongly convex f and the and the strong convexity is important because you can imagine a function let's say like here this is this the, the linear function is not strongly convex and now you can have so if we pick two points well you know the purple the interpolation of the function values is the same as the interpolation of the function um, as, as the same as the function applied to the interpolation of their values of the of the input so so and that that will happen all along, you know. You don't need to have the two points or the endpoints being the same. But if your function is you know strictly convex, then the only way, kind of in general, um, the only way in general that you will get this orange point to line up with this uh, pink point is actually if. You know, if if both of these actually end up moving to the same, so so you know this. Let, let me call this x one. Let's call this x two. If uh, they both actually end up equaling some other point c. So I hope, hope that makes sense. So the whole the whole idea is that equality in Jensen's uh, you know in Jensen's inequality, equality only holds if and only if um, the values. These, you know, the values you're evaluating at are all the same.
Okay, so that means if we go back to our KL divergence, that means the KL divergence um, will equal to zero if and only if you know all these RIs have the same values. So now what does that mean? So RI equal to C. So this is remember RI is equal to you know RI is equal to I think QI over PI. So we have so it goes to QI over PI must equal to C, right? So in other words, QI is equal to C times PI. But now if we sum both sides over I, we can take the C out. And these are now uh, um, probability masses, right? So they will just both, this is going to equal to one and it's going to equal to C times C times one. So therefore, C equals one, therefore, QI is equal to PI um, for all I, right? This is, this is, you know, this is for all I. So that's it. So basically, it, 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 so it tells us that, you know, in this discrete case, uh, the KL divergence um, is going to equal to zero if and only if PI equals to QI for all I. So that means if and only if the probability mass functions are the same, um, at all, you know, for all, um, for all indices, for all, for all of the symbols. Um, yeah, so I think so that's, that's, uh, the second half of, of the proof that, that, so not only, so we've kind of shown that, uh, one, that the KL divergence is greater than or equal to zero, um, and equality holds, so equality holds in general, if and only if RI equals to C, uh, which means if QI equals PI, importantly for all I. Uh, so that is about it uh, for yeah, showing those important properties of the KL divergence. I hope you found that uh, useful. As usual, please, uh, yeah, please let me know if you did. Uh, and if you didn't, or if you find a mistake, please um, let me know and I'm, I'd be happy to fix it and we all learn better that way. So thanks and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.